So, folks, we have with us the political leader of the NTA, uh, Mr. Gary Griffith. And, um, Gary, we saw the press release you made today regarding the announcement that um, Mrs. Ola here with Christopher have upped, so to say. She has signed an extension. We, we call it extension in the United States. An extension of a one-year contract as commissioner of police. I mean, I saw your press conference, but I want you to tell the people your take. As not, I saw your press release, but I want you to tell the people your take on the extension of Ms. Ola Christopher contract for another year. Yeah, well, certainly, um, good evening to all. This, if anybody, and I mean, it is unfortunate for this to become political, but anyone who's a supporter of Keith Rowley and the PNM, you really don't care about your country. You really don't care about your family. For this man to do this, what he has done basically is to show to the country, I do not care what you think. And that is it. It is a slap in the face. It is the ultimate uh, uh, sin sense of someone being a dictator. Because this is, this is a pattern. If it is somebody, he, what he, he can do is to double down on any time it is that there's confrontation or there's a difference in opinion. So if 89% of the country wanted Gary Griffith to remain as commissioner, he will say to himself, I do not care what you, the citizens, think. I am the prime minister and I am get, going to try to get rid of him. If it is that the country says Fitzgerald Hines is the worst minister of national security ever, he's a total failure, he tells the country, I do not care what you think. I am going to keep him there. So he doubles down and tells the country, I don't care to heck with you. If it is at 94%, polls of the done in their houses, 94 odd percent said that Ola Christopher must go. She's seen as the worst commissioner in our history. What Keith Rowley has done today is to tell the nation, I do not care what you think. I do not care what of your opinion. What I say goes. And that is the ultimate sense of a tyrant, of a dictator, of someone who says, I don't care what the vast majority of the country think. The only time I get your opinion is when it comes to Christopher has failed miserably. She has been, she has hidden herself from the public, from the media. She has not come up with one operational plan, one new unit, one bit of technology, any type of predictive policing, anything analytically driven. She has she has not said a word. She has the, the, the public confidence and trust in the police was 59% when it was handed over to Jacob and Lula Christopher. They have brought it down to 8%. She has totally embarrassed the Trinidad Tobago Police Service and it's no fault of the police officers. And now what Keith Rory has said is okay. So she is seen by the country as the worst commissioner ever. I do not care what you think. Fitzgerald Hines is seen as the worst minister. I do not care what you think. And you know, the, the, the irony of this, this is a total um, contrast to Kamala Pasabisessa. In the case of Kamala, when she was prime minister, if at any time there was a degree of, of, of uh, concern about a minister or a senator, she will have them fired. So she went from one extreme to Keith Rowley, where his one is, the person could be the most incompetent, the most unproductive, the, um, the, the person with no accountability, uh, poor leadership, poor results, I don't care. I am the prime minister and I will double down on it to show you the country that yours, what you feel does not matter. You know, Gary, I, I, I have heard some people saying that um, this reappointment for one year is a distraction by the PNM to get the people distracted. I kind of, I disagree with that. And this is my opinion. I disagree that this is a distraction because I think a commissioner of police is of significant importance to Trinidad and Tobago, especially with the predicament that we are in today with respect to crime. What says you? Yeah, no, no, you're, you're correct. The people who were saying that, they, they fail to understand that the decision that is going to be made, especially by the floating voters, that 100 to 150,000 who are not PNM or UNC till they die, the floating voters will, dictate, will decide the outcome of the general election. So it is obvious that the most important and critical thing for any citizen in this country right now is their right to live. 
their most fundamental right. That is the most, that is the biggest concern of citizens in this country right now. Security, their safety, law enforcement, making themselves feel safe, knowing that their children could get back home safely. So that is that decision is going to be the ultimate factor to decide who gets in government. So by doubling down on Ola Christopher, doubling down to keep Fitzgerald Hines, they have virtually given up the government. But that is how Keith Rowley operates. He will rather have everything destroyed. He will rather lose than to, than to be able to do the honorable thing, to do the, the mature thing, to do what the country wants, to do what is better for the country. And that says so much about the poor leadership of this man. He's obnoxious. He has shown total arrogance now. And he has shown that he just does not care. If I were prime minister and 89 or 94% of the country say that Ola Christopher is the worst commissioner ever, I must take that into my consideration. What is your process to decide to bring a lady that it was the highest crime rate. The country has never felt so fearful. The police um, confidence and trust in the police has never been so low when just before it was the highest ever. Now it is the lowest ever. So every single thing has shown that she has failed miserably. And let me add, this is not Ola Christopher now. Because um, in 2018, when international qualified experts around the world who select commissioners did the assessment for commissioner of police, Ola Christopher did not even come in the top 15. She got 52% of my 82%, 30% more. She was seen as a total failure by the experts. And the police service commission that was handpicked by a president who was handpicked by a prime minister, they decided to put her number one. So in Keith Rowley's cases, I don't care if she's not good. I don't care if she's incompetent. I don't care if she's a non-performer. I want her there, and I do not care what the country thinks. So he has basically given up the government because the government is now going to lose the election by a long mile based on this decision because it is obvious that Ola Christopher's competence or lack of is going to continue along the path of this country being um, succumbed to criminal elements. The gang association, they're having, they're cracking champagne and having parties tonight to know that this lady is in charge of law enforcement in this country. And this is because one individual says to the country, I do not care what you think. As a prime minister, you must listen to the views of the people. The voice of the people is the voice of God. And you have totally disregarded the voice of God. You have disregarded the voice of the people. You have said, I do not care what you think. I do not care what is right for you. I virtually do not care if the nation drowns in blood. I, Keith Rowley, will make my decision and to heck with what anyone thinks. And, the, and that is going to have a big say in the decision in the general election. You know, something just came to mind, right, Gary? The prime minister is out of the country. He's, he's in Ghana. And I think he's in um he's going to India um at some point in time. An important announcement like this, don't you think it's important for the prime minister to be in the country? I mean, I could be grasping for straws here. Don't you think with a significant appointment, reappointment like this, it will be good for the prime minister to have a press conference with himself, the commissioner of police, and the minister of national security? Um, no, no, actually, I think it was a shrewd move on his part. But because what he has, he has shown cowardice. So he, this was a deliberate intent while he's out of the country and he knows the whole country is going to be in an uproar over this decision. The coward that he is, because the biggest bully is always a coward. Know that. So what he has done, he, he has he decided to get out, he, out of the country. Let the decision be made. And the acting commissioner of police will easily say, well, no, this was a decision made by cabinet. Well, it's obvious that the prime minister would have directed them to do that prior to his departure. Cabinet would not have made a decision of this substance without his directive. So he would have informed cabinet, this is what may, must take place in my absence. And then he ran away to avoid the media, to avoid the public. So as much as he plays arrogant and plays he does not care, what he has done basically is, is covered ice, run out of the country, let the decision be made, and then by the time he comes back, try to throw a red herring to speak about some type of relationship with Trinidad Tobago and Ghana on his return, and then try to bully the media, shout at them, buff them, and then throw red herrings with, with legal firearms when 100% of murders committed um, by firearms in the last few years have been by illegal firearms. So that is the nature of the beast. That is how he operates. So this was strict, a, a strategically well-orchestrated plan by Keith Rowley to be out of the country and to make sure that he would not have to face the music for what he has done, which is to basically 
can over the country to the criminals by putting what has been seen as virtually the most incompetent law enforcement head in the history of Trinidad and Tobago to reappoint her. To each and every citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, whether you're red, blue, yellow, it does not matter. Whether you're PNM, UNC, NTA, ABC, or XYZ, this is a slap in the face of any law-abiding citizen that he has now given up and handed over Trinidad and Tobago to the criminal elements until general election. Gabby, I want to switch a little bit. Do you have an opinion with respect to the YouTubers who are coming to Trinidad and coming to Trinidad and Tobago and going into the belly of the beast, so to speak, like in Lavantil and Silot, and then broadcasting to the world, right, to, 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 to the world with regards to the situation in these communities? Do you have an opinion on that? I'm sorry, sorry. You just repeat that the call is dropping tremendously. I just yes. say, I know you asked if I had an opinion on someone right, in right. the country. I didn't, know right. who, I didn't hear what you said. What we have, we have some YouTubers coming from different parts of the world. We have one from Canada called Christmas List. We have another one from, um, I think it's Greece or somewhere from called Coco Boy. They are coming in and they are going into Lavantil and environs and yes, showing yes. a certain part of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, do you have an opinion on that? On how, you know, these guys are coming in and showing kind of the worst of Trinidad and Tobago, you know, and not showing... Well, yeah, well, well, well two things, you know, the media it is their right. And and sometimes these things are sensational. Um, but the fact is what they, are, what they are advertising and what they are... I wouldn't even use the word promoting. What they are bringing out are actual facts is that the country has become so taken over by criminal elements. The days of a few moments later, if you recall, there will not be one citizen in this country that will brandish a firearm or to make a threat on anyone. And within one hour, I will have him, I will have him crying like a baby, apologizing to the country and behind bars. That is the difference with one commissioner to another. These criminals now are showing off their firearms, knowing that nothing can be done, nothing will be done, and what they are now the, uh, the international media will now be coming in to, pro to, to have this put out and this is going to embarrass Trinidad and Tobago even more. But it is not their fault. That is their job. It, what should happen is that if it is your commissioner of police of substance and you have the type of technology, the type of units such as SORT, those individuals within an hour, we would have found them. They would have been handcuffed. They would have been in a, in a prison cell crying and apologizing a few moments later. Not anymore, because Keith Rory has decided to put the most incompetent person to run the police service. She is afraid to speak to the media. She cannot, she has not, whereas I will every Wednesday, I will face the brunt of the media, give them technology, units, um, programs, policies to show that we are, we are transforming the police service, pegging back criminal elements. Ola Christopher, in the year that she has been commissioner of police, has been afraid to have one media conference, have the media confront her because she's afraid. You could go back to 2018 when she was interviewed. She got 23 out of 50 in the interview, the lowest out of about 20-something persons who applied for the post. She got 3 out of 15 in the mock media conference. She got 3 out of 15 in role fit play. That is the character of the person who Keith Rowley has reappointed. So if it is that international media see that this is an opportunity for them to get proper mileage and by, by being able to speak to criminal elements who are so brazen they do not care by showing off their weapons, it says so much about the lack of leadership that has gone out the window, not just by the police service, but by the Ministry of National Security, by an incompetent prime minister, next to an incompetent minister of security, national security, and who has now reappointed the most incompetent police commissioner. So as I said, it is not you're not going to put James Bond or Rambo to work with, with, um, with Mr. Bean or Tommy Joseph. So they are all in the same level, the same caliber, the same level of incompetence. And that was probably the problem that they had with me because I was a do on a shaker, making things happen, stepping on toes, inclusive of persons closely aligned to the same government. And they had a problem with that. So now Ola Christopher is along their standard. The international media is now going to come in and milk it and absolutely nothing is being done. So it's not the media to be blamed. It is, the, the, again, the decision by Keith Christopher Rowley. Gary, what about the illegal CCTVs, CCTVs that was put up? And I don't know, so far I don't think anybody has been arrested or, or, or caught. What about that? I mean, how could that, something like that, go, you know, unchecked? Oh, oh, oh. Well, I'll tell you what, why, why it could be done. When it is used totally dismantled 
our intelligence units, such as the Special Operation Response Team, such as the online reporting for tip-offs, such as um, the covert operative units that we had undercover officers, such as the social media monitoring unit, removing the director of the SSC. When you totally dismantle our intelligence systems because of your petty arrog and uh, your arrogant behavior, these things will take place right on the nose of the police stations. So, be, so when this happens now, and let me add to it, we had a national operations center with, with persons monitoring all of the cameras. We had an operational command center with police officers looking at all of these cameras, monitoring the, the criminals. You shut that down after I left. So now you, you the law enforcement agencies that had an operational center, you shut down. And now the criminals have an operational center utilizing their own cameras to monitor the police. That shows the difference with my standard to that of Keith Rowley. Under the Gary Griffith tenure, the law enforcement agencies had cameras to monitor the criminals. Now under Keith Rowley, without Gary Griffith, you have the criminals having their, their security cameras monitoring the police. That is what the country has to face. And to anybody who has the audacity to say that I would vote for the PNM, what you are virtually saying is I do not care if it increases the chance of my wife being killed, my daughter being kidnapped, or my son being um, uh, killed. Gary, I want to shift focus a little bit. And I want to talk about the big, the big scandal that's happening in Trinidad and Tobago with respect to this missing billions of dollars of taxpayers money you know and not only that gary but when the minister of finance is putting personal calls to the aud auditor general cell phone i mean is is if, if if those type of things well you will know better does those reach the level of misbehavior in public office is that right? Well, yeah, well, it is, beyond, it is beyond the level of disdain. It is what is known as democratic dictatorship. We are, our constitution is so flawed. One man and one man alone handpicks the president, the chief justice, the attorney general, the commissioner of police, the chief of defense staff, and every single person in independent institutions, inclusive of the police service commission, because the president is handpicked by the prime minister. So that is where we have reached. So anyone who has a position of standing firm and stating this is an independent institution, you have no right to encroach and try to bully yourself into directing me in a manner unbecoming of me in my position, whereby I swore an oath to office to my God and to my country. And that is why he would have removed a commissioner of police, that director of the SSC, head of the Integrity Commission, head of the Central Bank, head of, um, of the... <clears throat> Uh, we, we have seen now with the Auditor General, the Industrial Court. This is what is happening. They are removing slow, slowly every single person in independent office who has some degree of substance to say, you cannot ab abuse me and direct me to do things to benefit you and your party politically. So the Auditor General is just number six or seven of persons. As I said, the Commissioner of Police Office, the Director of the SSA, Head of the Industrial Court, Head of the Central Bank, <clears throat> Um, head of the um, now the auditor general, and and that is and that is what is happening. So in this situation, what he has done yet again is to double down on their arrogance. Because by now, yet again, what this government is doing is handpicking people closely aligned to them, probably paying them big taxpayers' dollars and stating that they are going to launch an investigation. You cannot launch an investigation. You are politicians, and it's the same thing they did with myself as commissioner of police. And after when you hire Stanley Jokey John, the uh, previous judge, with no training or qualification in investigation, you then hire three previous members of the police service who were never instrumental in any aspects of firearm. Um, corruption. You hire these people, the state, pay them big money, and then they write a report. Stanley Jokey John said it was a massive, well oiled criminal industry. So, you, so the state pays people big money. They write reports that are full of lies, inaccurate information, deliberately designed, however, conveniently to smear the character of those persons who stand up to you as a government. And then you state it was a massive, well oiled criminal industry. And four years later, not one person arrested, not one person charged. And the only person held is a person in Barbados where you, as the, where you as a senior minister, gave directives to, to the police 
to break the law and to kidnap someone in Barbados. This thing with your Auditor General is no different. What they are doing now is handpicking people. You have handpicked a judge, a retired judge. I think he was a family court judge with no training, qualification, or knowledge in forensic or talk, um, auditing. And you hired this individual to deal with missing money with hundreds of millions of dollars. That is what they do. And then the man is going to say, well, nothing was wrong with it. It's the fault of the Auditor General. Smear the character of the Auditor General and show that she is to blame. The country is not buying it anymore. You have made a major blunder. And instead of you accepting responsibility, you are doubling down on the Auditor General because she has stood firm to show you are incompetent as a Minister of Finance to make such a major blunder. I knew this about, about uh, Colin Imbut, the Dwen, since I was commissioner of police, <clears throat> when it is that I stated that they have refused to put funding to the police service for six months um, to try to maintain, for us to pay the expenses of the police service. The man had the audacity to say, no, he went in parliament. Look, we paid $800 million to the police. The, the joker, that somebody who did basic form five or high school accounting will understand that 800 million was for salaries. You just vote for salaries cannot equate with purchase for and to payment for goods and services. That is how clueless he was. And now he has done the same thing. You have you cannot balance hundreds of millions of dollars because you are an incompetent minister of finance. And instead of you accepting responsibility, you decide to double down by hiring people, call them investigators to do an investigation led by a, a previous judge with no training or qualification in forensic accounting. And then when it is the report comes out, try to say that I wasn't to be blamed, it was who? The country is fed up of this nonsense, these lies, handpicking people, calling them investigators. Because basically what they're doing is they're oh, this overreach. They are now encroaching on the authority of the Office of the Commissioner of Police, the Director of the SSA, the Auditor General, the, the Integrity Commission, um, the head of the Central Bank, the Industrial Court. When will it end? And again, to all the PNM till you dead, I challenge you to debate with me on this topic. Gary, here is a question from the chat, right? Someone said, Mr. Gary, do you believe early reappointment is to protect Suzette? Um, I, I, I'm not sure who Suzette is. Suzette appointment due to involvement in the Barbados matter. Um, I know you're talking about the, um, the, the firearms dealer situation that was kidnapped from Barbados and brought back. To Trinidad. Oh, sorry, so, your credit card is dropping badly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's coming and going. All right. So, can you repeat? yeah, right. Yeah. So, there's a question from the chat where a person says, Mr. Gary, do you believe early reappointment is to protect Suzette appointment due to involvement in the Barbados matter? I think he's talking about the, the situation with the. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, again, that matter is undergoing investigation, is, is being investigated. Um, it wouldn't matter. You see, if whoever they put as commissioner of police, this matter would not be dealt with. And I'll tell you why. This is not about Suzette Martin. Suzette Martin was given instructions by a government minister. The reason I could tell you that a minister is the person responsible is that I, have, I am the only person in the Caribbean that has ever been a minister of national security and a commissioner of police. So I know the role and function of both. No commissioner of police has the authority to send any member of the police service outside of the territorial waters of Trinidad and Tobago unless you have the authorization from a senior government minister. If it is that the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force hockey team has to go Barbados, if the Trinidad and Tobago police, police football team has to go to New York on a, big, on a football game, you must get the approval from the government. So it was a government official, a government minister that gave and directed Suzette Martin and company. So it's not Suzette Martin to be blamed. They were given instructions to leave the country. No police officer in Trinidad and Tobago can get authorization to get a CARICOM aircraft. So for this being done, it was a government minister. <clears throat> so regardless of who they put as commissioner of police, this matter is not going to be investigated until the government changes. And I promise you from day one, there's going to be an immediate commission of inquiry. And that minister who gave the authorization should and would be charged for aiding and abetting in kidnapping and abducting of a Trinidad and Tobago citizen, hence again, yet again, embarrassing Trinidad and Tobago and Barbados. Wow, wow, interesting, interesting. There is another statement, right, Gary? The prime minister said it was not he who recruited re re retired Judge Stanley John to investigate the issuance of firearm users' license. But the police service commission. What says you? This is a this is a, a right. Okay. So 
Yeah, so let me clarify. <clears throat> this the name Stanley John popped up conveniently after Keith Rowley used President's House as a post office to meet with Blissy Prasad. Blissy Prasad then returns to the um, Office of the Police Service Commission, decides to withdraw the Americans without their approval, tries to suspend me without their approval, and then Stanley John name pops up. And you know, since I have, I have been saying that Stanley John, <clears throat> it was the state that paid Stanley John. But the state paid Stanley John, and then again, the state paid for the three persons who were handpicked by the government to then do an audit. The end result by all of these reports is after four years, not one person charged, not one person convicted, not one person arrested, yet Stanley Jokey John claimed it was a massive, well oiled criminal industry. If that is not incompetence at the highest level, I do not know what is. Wow. It, you know, it's, it, it's just interesting that there are so many things seem to be happening in Trinidad and Tobago on a daily basis. And when a lot of things seems to happen, Gary, that is either the prime minister is here, or even though when I say here in Trinidad and Tobago, even sometimes when he's there, it seems like he's not there when there are serious issues. And Gary, we have seen many serious issues happen in Trinidad and Tobago as far as crime is concerned. And we didn't hear from the commissioner of police. It's only recently when I think the last situation happened, we saw her touring the communities. When you were commissioner of police and a serious issue happened, you know, what, 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 what was your modus operandi? How, what did you do when serious situation happened? Like masculine? Yeah, well, well, like well her, her activity by going to Kukrit was nothing short of being pathetic. It was cosmetic. And then, so you turn up there with all the senior officers, as the express editorial stated, what do you expect all of them to do? To go on the crime scene and be looking for clues? It was cosmetic. It, the damage was already done. What was required is something known as predictive policing. But this, we had what we did. We stopped dozens upon dozens of murders before it took place. So, you know, a lot of times we have these criminologists. Trinidad and Tobago, by the way, is the only country in the world where our media contacts criminologists to get information and their views as it pertains to law enforcement because of their ignorance and not understanding that a criminologist, his role and function, his training is to understand the cause of crime. They do not understand law enforcement. They are never involved in policing. You will never hear the media contact a criminologist to ask about what do you think about the NYPD's performance? So, it, but again, our criminologists in this country, they stay at the phone waiting for the media to contact them and make the most stupid statements. So one of the things my two criminologists on the newspapers yesterday is that they said one thing Ola did well was intelligence-driven policing. And, you know, they never said name one thing she has done in involving intelligence-driven policing. Because we formed SWAT, you shut it down. We had SWAT intelligence unit, you shut it down. We had the operational command center, you shut it down. We had the commissioner's command center, you shut it down. We had body cameras on all the police officers, you shut it down. We had dashboard cameras, live footage from the, from the ERP vehicles, you shut both of them down. We had the national operations center, it has been shut down. You had the director of the SSA, you had covert operators, you shut him down. I had undercover officers, you shut it down. I had um, online reporting to give the police information, you shut it down. I could go on for the next half an hour. She shut down and dismantled every single thing as it pertained to allow predictive policing, intelligence-led policing. And these criminologists, as clueless as they are, had the audacity to say, well, Ula Christopher did a good job. And that is Darius Figuera and uh, I think um, um, some other criminologists. So that has, that has been the problem. So she turns up there on the scene it serves no purpose other than a photo op. You turn up there in Garbadine. You need, we need a commissioner of police that is not Garbadine oriented, but camouflage. Not one holding a cane, but a gun. Not one that stays in their office, but on the road, on the streets, on the ground, with their troops, leading by example. What the PNM have done is given the country yet again a Garbadine one cane carrying admin officer behind a desk. And because of the behind the desk, and because of that, the, there's going to be leadership out of the window. There's going to be lack of proper tactical um, systems, poor strategies, no intelligence-driven policing, no predictive policing. And what we are going to do is falter. How, how I can say it worked? In that last year, before COVID, sorry, before the SOE, before the curfew, in that year from May 2020 to May 2021, we had about 350-odd murders. It reached almost double two months after I left. 
during the same period as SOE and curfew, when people tried to say, well, that was the cause for the massive reduction, we cracked it. The criminals were pegged back because of the systems we put in place. And by you shutting down and dismantling all of this out of petty politics, the country is suffering. And again, I, I challenge anyone after this interview, anyone who's a PNM till you die, I challenge you to come proudly and say that I am going to intend to still vote for the PNM. You there? Hello? Yes, I am. Yes, I All am. right. So here, here, here is another statement, right? I want you to respond to this statement. Acting Commissioner of Police, Ulla Christopher, has topped the merit list of candidates for the substantive position of Commissioner. Oh, sorry, the call is dropping again. Okay. I think you got to go closer. All right. All right. Not, uh, it's yeah. dropping badly. When you... All right. So here is the statement. You hear me better now? Yes, I am. Yeah, here is the statement. Acting Commissioner of Police, Ulla Christopher, has topped the merit list of candidates for the substantive position of Commissioner of Police. Her name has been submitted to the Parliament in keeping with the requirements of the law. That's the statement. Um, I, I don't know if you know anything about that. Yeah, well, and again, that exactly confirms my point. In 2018, now what we had for the system to up, uh, up for the merit list, it must be done by international qualified experts that Trinidad and Tobago we do not have. So these international qualified experts that were responsible for, for selecting dozens of commissioners around the world in different countries, when Ola Christopher's performance was measured by several different things, from role fit, from interviews, mock media conference, tactical exams, uh, written operational plan, um, background check, uh, psycho um, psychometric testing, and so forth, she did not come in the top 15. I got the highest of all persons who applied for commissioner with 82%. She got 52%. She failed miserably. And this, these were by experts. Then after, then two years later, I got 94% to her 74%. A year after that, when the PNM handpicked president selects a handpicked police service commission comprising individuals with no qualification, knowledge, or experience in law enforcement, policing, or national security. You pick a retired judge, you pick a criminologist, you pick a, a financial accountant, and a, and a speaking consultant. That is who you selected. And they now took a lady who got 30% less than others by qualified experts and put her first. These, this police service commission is the fault. We blame Ola Christopher. You can't blame someone for being a failure and incompetent. She does not have it, but she applied. It is her right to apply. But these quacks in the police service commission, who saw, who again, by qualified experts, had Ola Christopher not even in the top 15, you decide to have her jump over everyone to come first. This was, Ola Christopher has been imposed on us by a police service commission who was handpicked by a politician by a president, sorry, who was handpicked by a politician. And that is the problem. So when it is that we speak about Ola Christopher topping the merit list, she topped the merit list by persons who were appointed by a politically appointed president and individuals with no training, qualification, or knowledge in law enforcement. They are clueless. So when you compare that, that is the problem we have now in the selection process for a police commissioner. Gary, on another note, how are things going with your campaign in St. Joseph? Well, um, it couldn't be better. Um, obviously, PNM is quaking. Terence Yal Singh has started singing. I uh, hope he keeps his day job, which, which even that he does not do because he has been missing in action for the last nine years as a member of parliament for St. Joseph. What I have promised St. Joseph is that unlike Terence Yal Singh, who has spent all of his time in his luxurious ministerial office with his Prado and having persons salute him with hundreds of persons. I intend to be there to fix St. Joseph. I intend to make St. Joseph safe again and get it in government. I intend to defend our country. We have a nation to defend. So it is more than just St. Joseph. The fact of the matter is who usually wins St. Joseph would win the election. And that is why the PNM are throwing every single thing at me in the hope, the desperate hope that they could, that the, some of the mud would, would stick. It has, they have failed, they have been weighed, measured, and found wanting, and St. Joseph has totally will, will go away from the PNM. Whoever wins St. Joseph wins the election, and that is what is bothering them. That is why they have spent all of their time on their witch hunting, fishing expedition, pertaining to legal firearms, and after four years with their stupidity, 
as I said, not one person arrested because they were full of lies. What is happening now is that they've spent all of their time trying to focus on legal firearms, which have been instrumental in saving many lives and not one finger lifted to deal with what has been instrumental in almost 100% of murders by firearms, which is illegal firearms. Gary, I want to say something, right? I want to say something from far, from afar, right? I hope that the NTA and the UNC work out any differences with St. Joseph and they can make you the person running for St. Joseph without having to compete against another candidate from the UNC. I hope that... Yeah, well, yeah. well, well, you're, well you're correct. Um, <laughs> the, the data will show, the history will show that, that especially in marginal seats such as Sawa, Barataria, St. Joseph, Tunapuna, Lupino Bonaire, La Hoqueta, Talparo, San Fernando West, and San Grande, those seven or eight seats, and Shogunas East or West, I think. So those eight seats... If there's a three horse race, the PNL will win most of those seats, if not if not all. And that is how it became um, 26 15 in 2007. That is how the PNM won handsomely in 1991 and also in 1981. Uh, when it is that there's a two horse race with the unification of bridge constituency parties with either the UNC or the ULF, you will get an annihilation of the PNM similar to what happened in 1986 and also 2010. So yes, definitely, um, a, a, some sort of a strategic alliance would always be the deciding factor. And it is hoped that some degree of governance of principles uh, that the NTA will stand firm on, that other political parties would work alongside us, work with us, not compete with us. We come up to some common system of agreement to ensure that there will be good governance. We stand on certain principles and we will make and, and we will ensure that this government will be the best government Trinidad to be good have seen in decades. And, and lastly, before you go, Gary, you know, you can't go to, you, uh, you very rarely you go to an interview and people don't ask you the, a question about this person, right? You know, sometimes you don't answer and sometimes, you know, you say, you know, you know, you know, give, give it any ear. Do you consider the political leader of the PEP to be a third force in Trinidad and Tobago? And here why I ask that question, right, Gary? In the 2020 election, the PEP had 5,933 votes. The largest amount of votes came in two constituencies from Dego Martin. Dego Martin. And if you were to give either the PNM or the UNC those numbers, it will be, an, it, it will be of no significance. It will be insignificant. Right? So I don't understand how somebody could call themselves a third force where the votes that you have garnered wouldn't make any difference to any one of the parties, whether he decide to go for the PNM or whether he decide to go for the UNC. What says you? Yeah, yeah, you're dropping again. You're dropping again. Oh, okay. So I was just talking quickly about the political leader. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Call himself yeah, a so, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, <laughs> I, I got you. So again, what I find totally alarming is the sign is the is how anyone in the media really actually considers the PP as, as a force of relevance. Philip Alexander, from what I gather, has resigned from politics about six times in the last few years and re and reappointed himself. That's why it is that he's known, that I refer to him as Flip Flop Flip. Uh, that you, you resigned for your party recently and then you call a meeting, even though you resigned, to reappoint yourself as political leader. That is, the, that is absolute madness. You have left the party, you have resigned and then you summon a meeting. How could you summon a meeting if you're not in the party, if you have resigned as political leader? So you, you summon a meeting to reappoint yourself as political leader? I can't do that in the NTA. If you resign from the NTA, you're not in the executive, if you're not in the executive. So I don't even know if he's the political leader. Added to which, all the three deputy political leaders and everyone else left. Philip Alexander has flip-flopped from supporting the PNM, the last thing he said is that he will work for Rowley for free and he will make sure Gary Griffin and Kamala never get in government. Two months later, he jumps to say that he's supporting Kamala. Three weeks later, he says he's not supporting Kamala if Gary is there. Two weeks later, he says he's supporting Kamala nevertheless. A week later, he says all of us must work together. And then last week, he flip-flops again to say he's back on his own. How could anyone, anyone expect to vote for somebody when you do not know what side of the bed he's going to get upon? He tries to compare me to the difference with Gary Griffith is I stand firm on principle. I don't flip-flop. So regardless of 
the position I am, when I'm Minister of National Security, I see the life sport being something that is not appropriate. I will stand firm on that. That is not flip-flop. That is patriotism. If I'm Commissioner of Police and I'm appointed by the PNM and the PNM is doing something wrong, I will stand firm against them. That is not flip-flop. That is patriotism. Flip-flop is the point that you're just jumping from pillar to post. And worse of the most important thing is every single comment he makes is to attack, it is to destroy, it is to discredit everyone other than Keith Rowley and Fitzgerald Hines. Two people he does that bad talk is Fitzgerald Hines, especially, and Keith Rowley. Everything is the bad talk, Kamala. He spent every single day in the local government election talking about Gary Griffith. Somebody had to tell him, I'm happily married. I'm not interested. The man has a to bank over me. Why would you be headed a political party that is not in government or opposition and you spend all your time by talking on the head of another political party that is not in government or opposition it is either you have a top banker for that person or you have an agenda on behalf of others so to those people who vote for that party those are just individuals that hate the pnm and the unc and if bin laden brings a party in Trinidad and tobago they will vote for that for that, for that party. So it is not that he has any substance. He lost every single deposit in the local government election. He failed miserably. So the fact of the matter is that um, for us to even consider this as any deciding factor, what he does is it seems that his job, as we continue to call him the PNMB team, is to go there and hope that he could get votes in that persons may have voted for the NT or the UNC and hope that his less than 100 votes could be the deciding factor in the hope that PNM can win their seat. Now, that may very well happen in local government, mind you, because sometimes in local government, you could win or lose a seat by less than 100 votes. But when it comes to marginal seats, his 150 votes or 50 votes that he's going to get is going to be virtually insignificant. No one loses a marginal seat by an insignificant party. If it is that he decides to be mature one day, spend his time instead of just trying to destroy, discredit, attack, have a smear campaign, destroy the character of individuals, people can may one day take him seriously. And last question, last question, guy from the chat. Somebody says, who is renting the police uniform to the men on the block? Well, it's not really that. You see what happens, and again, I actually changed the police uniform, similar to the NYPD. When I signed that bilateral agreement with the NYPD, it was not just about training, tactics, customer service, technology. It was the image. Image is everything. So I remember in the mid-90s with when Mayor Giuliani transformed and um, brought down crime. Citizens did not feel safe. He had to transform the image of the police service. So this is what I did. I got the approval to bring in pepper spray, tasers, um, the belt, the body cameras, the communication devices, and the uniform. The present uniform that the police service have here is something that any security, some security companies have, a, a, a dark blue long sleeve and a dark and a blue denim pants. Anyone could purchase that and they then imitate themselves as police officers. We were getting the type of uniform similar to that of the NYPD and Chicago PD. People will look at the officers, see them. It will have the police badge, which I also approved, and they stopped being used as well. So people will not be able to imitate police officers. You can't imitate a police officer in NYPD or Chicago or Detroit because of the type of uniform. You can do it in Trinidad and Tobago because it's a similar uniform to what security companies have. But it again shows the failure of Ola Christopher to understand what is known as 21st century policing. Gary, it's always a pleasure and on short notice for you to join us here in the village. Any closing words before you go? Hey, Gary, Gary, wait, 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 Gary, 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 abroad, Gary that, one minute. That we, that, yes. Gary, one minute. I want to say something. I want you to, uh, sure. uh, you guys have a policy, uh, the NT have a policy about the diaspora. I would like to hear you guys talk about that a little more for us out here. And whisper to a few people in the coalition you're going to have about that. I think that is a splendiferous, marvelous, fantabulous policy that can go a long way when an election comes. I just wanted to put that in. Go ahead. Well, and, well, well I, would be, I would be traveling later this year to Miami, to New York, to Toronto, to London. And, to, and this is not a sales pitch, but it's to get citizens, and I use the word citizens correctly, citizens of this great country, Trinidad and Tobago. Someone who has dual citizenship, does, it, would not, it does not make you any less a citizen than someone who lives in Trinidad and Tobago. It is similar to an American citizen. They are in almost every single one of the 200 countries around the world, living, 
retiring, working, but it doesn't make them any less a U.S. citizen than someone who lives in the United States. And that is what I intend to achieve. I intend to make sure Trinidad and Tobago understands and recognize the importance, the significance of persons who may have migrated, who may be working elsewhere, but they still have a Trinidad and Tobago passport. And once you have that, I intend as a new government to treat you and to recognize you citizens abroad with Trinidad and Tobago passports as true citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. You have not been treated as citizens for the last few decades because governments come and go and they're afraid to do the ultimate thing. The most, one of the most important things you can do as a citizen is to decide who is your leader. And they have refused to give you that opportunity. I intend to do that. I intend to ensure that every single citizen in Trinidad and Tobago and outside of Trinidad and Tobago would have that opportunity to vote in our general elections. And it is very simple. We will be setting up um, polling stations in the high commissions of in Miami, in New York, in Washington, in Toronto, in London, in Geneva, in China, in, um, in Rio, in Brazil, in Venezuela. Every single place we have a high commission, it is easy to set up and it gives you the opportunity to have your to exercise your franchise of the most democratic thing you can do, which is vote. That I promise you. Yeah, we want to thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank Take you. care. All right.